The train, for its type, is the most powerful vehicle on land. And the engines of Sodor are the power behind the docks, industries and branch lines that make up the world-renowned Northwestern Railway. These are the stories of Sodor. It's only just occurred to me how little I've talked about the political situation on Sodor. I know that may not sound terribly exciting, but it is essential I explain it for the purposes of today's story. You see, prior to 1946, the island didn't actually have a central government. Instead, almost every town had its own mayor, administration and so forth. Needless to say, on such a small island, this hodgepodge arrangement led to a number of problems. It wasn't uncommon for the disparate councils to argue over every little thing. Backbiting and buck-passing was rampant, and vital infrastructure like roads and bridges often fell into disrepair as a consequence. Thankfully, the Atlee government chose to step in. Apart from nationalising several industries, they also set about amalgamating the various councils of Great Britain into larger ones. This included Sodor, and on September 20th, 1946, the Sodor Council was sworn in. It was also on that day the island's capital city was officially declared. And it surprised a great many of us. Vickerstown? Really? Why are you in such disbelief, Henry? No offense, Matt. I know you used to work there. It's just... Um... It hasn't changed much since your day. So I've heard. A pity, really. It was originally going to be Sodor's capital, you know. It was? Yes. When the Sodor Mainland Railway was formed, it was going to be the catalyst for centralizing the island. Why didn't it happen? Too much resistance. The local councils didn't want to lose their powers. <laughs> Ironically, they actually banded together to resist the idea of a central government. And it worked. And they couldn't see what they had accomplished as a united force. Obviously not, Henry or it wouldn't have taken so many decades for it to come to this moment. And speaking of decades, I was worried I was going to be stuck in the works for that long. Yes, it's nice to see you back in service, James. I don't think I've said welcome back yet. Thank you, Matt. I'm certainly glad to be back. And astounded the fat controller of all people has taken over. I just wish he hadn't run Corbett out before I had a chance to tear into him. Run him out? What do you mean? Oh, hadn't you heard? Corbett resigned. Freeman too. They did? I thought Sir Topham was going to keep them on. That was the plan, but they ended up resigning a couple of weeks ago. No one really knows why, but there are all sorts of rumours, often accompanied by the words embezzlement and philanderer. And you can't tell me that wasn't by design on the Fat Controller's part. How could it be? He said to all of us he wanted them to stay on. Then why tell us in the first place that he was aware of their improprieties? Why say such a thing publicly if it wasn't meant to stir up conversation and inquiries? I guess you have a point, James. Whatever the truth, I doubt we'll ever know. But we will know what the fucking troller is planning tonight at Brendam. What's happening at Brendam? James and I have to spend the night there. The fat controller said he was going to pop by to make an important announcement. And we're taking bets on the subject. You want in, Matt? Using what? It's not like I carry any money. And what good is money to an engine anyway? Oh, we're using something far more valuable than cash. What? Bragging rights. So you can see why James is so keen to win. Shut up, Henry. All right, lads. And lasses, finalize your bets. I'll wager on a new engine. The opening of a new branch line. New rolling stock. The closure of a station. The building of a new mine. And I'm betting on a reshuffle. What exactly do you mean by a reshuffle, James? 
I mean, perhaps we'll finally get some consistency in our duties. No more of this everybody does everything nonsense. I don't see why that would bother you, James. You are a mixed traffic engine after all. Yes, but that's what I was built for. I'm talking about the likes of Gordon pulling goods trains or Peter taking coaches. I don't mind doing that. It makes a nice change. I agree. Our versatility proves our worth. Why are you wagering on a reshuffle anyway, James? Do you know something? Indeed. I made some inquiries, and throughout his career, every time the Fat Controller was appointed manager of a particular region, he always started his tenure by assigning specific jobs for his engines and people. So you lot had best be prepared for my inevitable triumph. Oh, keep dreaming that it's your well. win, mate. Well, we're about to find out. Good evening, engines. How are things? Very good, sir. How are you settling into life on Sodor? Quite easily, I'm pleased to say. The people here truly are wonderful. I feel right at home. And you lot have certainly made the transition easier. So thank you for that. No problem, sir. Now, would you mind telling us why you've gathered us here? Of course not, James. I'll get right to it. It concerns the formation of the Sodor Council. It concerns what, sir? The Sodor Council, James. Vickers Town might seem like an odd choice for the island's capital, but it does make a lot of sense if you consider the fact it is the first location people pass through when they come to Sodor by rail. And history has shown those towns and cities centered around heavy rail traffic tend to flourish. But, sir, that's been the case with Vickers Town for years. And no disrespect to its residents, but it's little more than a village. Which is why a massive redevelopment of Vickers Town has been proposed. New housing, schools, roadways, hospitals, council buildings, everything. This also includes its station and yard, which will be completely overhauled. And we will be assisting in this massive endeavor. So it's a construction project, sir. Indeed it is, Samantha. One that will generate a huge number of jobs and contracts. When does it start, sir? This Friday. Each of you will be given your assignments to further the project, which will operate on a rotating basis. The redevelopment is expected to be completed by April 1st of next year. And no, that's not a joke. Are there any questions? No? Then I will ask one. Who won the bet? I think Toby did. He bet on a construction project of some kind. I'm not counting that. Oh, oh whatever. Yeah. You oh, 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 yeah. Pull the other one. Aye. You lost the bet, James. Take it like a man. Oh, son of a... What was that, Thomas? The station at Vickerstown burnt down! But, 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 how? I don't know, but there's nothing left but ashes. Goodness, that's awful. I don't know what to say. How about April Fools? Why would I... Wait, what? <laughs> See you later, Gordon. Why, that little rapscallion! When I get my hands on him... You don't have hands, Gordon. It's a figure of speech, you halfwit. Halfwit, eh? At least I was smart enough to know Thomas was joking. So you do know at least one thing, Eric. Amazing. I'll lay off him, Gordon, you galloping sausage. 
Phew, marvellous. It must be insulting Gordon Day again. All right, all right, engines, that's enough. Oh, Sir Topham, we weren't expecting you this evening. Well, I had a couple of announcements to make. First, I want to congratulate you all on your fantastic performance these past few months. The Sodor Council was amazed by your efforts and will be formally acknowledging them tomorrow during the ribbon-cutting ceremony at the Town Hall. And the second point? You're not going to like it much, James. Why not, sir? Because you would have been right in that wager you made. You were just wrong in the timing. You mean... Yes, indeed. A reshuffle is about to happen. What sort of reshuffle, sir? The kind intended to streamline operations here on Sodor. One of the many things I admire about non-faceless engines is your versatility. Even when built to carry out specific jobs, you are always willing and able to do more. We're only doing our jobs, sir. Except, you haven't really been, Henry. I've reviewed your records extensively, and it seems to me that your willingness to take on jobs outside your purview has led to an overall drop in efficiency. Please don't misunderstand, I am not blaming you for this. As you said, Henry, you were just doing your jobs. I'm a bit confused, sir. What exactly are you getting at? To get to the point, I have decided to assign certain engines, certain jobs to certain regions of the island. That way, each part of Sodor will be serviced effectively. I will begin with the mainline fleet. Gordon and Reginald, you will handle passenger trains. Henry and Peter, goods work. And mixed traffic duties for Donald and James. Is there to be a shunter for Napford, sir? There is, Gordon. I have decided to appoint Samantha. A most excellent choice, sir. I knew you'd say that, Reggie. What about the rest of the lads, sir? Where will they be working? To the newly constituted mainline fleet of Sodor, the Fat Controller outlined the rest of the appointments. Thomas, Percy and Toby were assigned to the Farquhar branch. Eric and I were transferred to the Brendan branch to work alongside Douglas, Diesel and Adam with Peckett becoming the shunter for Vickerstown. All of us quickly settled into our new roles. Indeed, it was nice to have some consistency in our work. However, that wasn't to say there weren't problems. <sighs> so, sorry I'm late, Peckett. You're not too far behind, Peter. Are you alright? You sound out of puff. Just, just a bit knackered is all. I was late leaving Carlden, so I had to make up for lost time. That was probably my fault, Peter. You likely had to wait until I was out of Knapford before you could leave. What was the hold-up? I had to wait for Donald to pass with a fuel train. A fuel train? Are we doing the petrol deliveries now? It seems so. Oh, <sighs> blimey. The Fat Controller's got us on a tight schedule. Indeed. Or maybe it just seems that way since it's new. Perhaps we'll settle into it in time. I hope so. Well, Thomas? What? You're five minutes late. Because of that, you've thrown out the timetable. Now I'm going to be late at every station between here and Croven's Gate. Oh, sorry James. What's the matter with you? Why do you care? I care in that if this is going to be a habit, that it'll keep affecting you and your precious timetable. You know what James, you're a real prat. What's the matter with Thomas? Oh dear Toby, it looks like he's starting to act out. Aye, not a good sign. Act out about what? He hasn't seen Kate in a while. Why not? Oh wait, he used to take the petrol to the mine. That he did. But since you lot on the main line have taken on the job, how long has it been since they've seen each other? Over a month, and he's worried they're starting to drift apart. I wish there was something we could do. Maybe we can. I think I'll have a chat to the Fat Controller about it. Please do, Toby. I'd welcome a lightening of the load. 
Are you having problems with the deliveries, Donald? Not the deliveries themselves. I mean the actual job. It's one too many, and those of us on the main line are hard-pressed as it is. I see. Well, if we both have a word with Sir Topham, we might get better results. Hello, Toby. Hello, Sir Topham. What brings you out this way? Just checking to see how the reshuffle is working. Or, if it isn't. Have there been problems, sir? I am slightly concerned for the mainline crew. I think I may have erred in assigning them the jobs they have. It's funny you should say such a thing, sir. I wanted to speak to you about that. The mainline's workload? Partly, sir. But first, I need to broach another topic with you. It's about Thomas. Yes. I heard about the little spat he and James had earlier. You did, sir? Some of the passengers complained. I'll be speaking to him about why he acted the way he did. Um, I can save you a bit of time there, Sir Topham. You can? How? Morning, Sir Topham. Good morning, Thomas. How are you? Um, a bit nervous and confused, sir. The station master said you wanted to speak to me? Yes. I wanted to tell you I heard about your argument with James yesterday. I came to find out the reason behind it, but I've since been made aware of what it is. Oh. Thomas, I understand the feeling. Being separated from someone you love is not an easy thing to live with. But it's important we not take our frustrations out on others. It's hardly fair to them, is it? No, sir. It isn't. I'm sorry. It won't happen again. I swear. Very good. Now, having said that, I've been giving some thought about the current workload assigned to the mainline. I think it's becoming too much, and it just so happens they also agree. Donald had a word with me last night and suggested that I should transfer the fuel delivery runs to your group on the Farquhar branch. I've decided to act on this recommendation. You have, sir? Now don't go getting overly excited, Thomas. I am not doing this solely for your benefit. The point was made that you, Percy and Toby, have a lot of experience in delivering the petrol, which is why I am willing to give your crew this remit. However, if I find this begins to adversely affect your ability to carry out your assigned duties, I will be forced to make other arrangements. I understand, sir. Don't worry, we won't let you down. Good to hear. There's a fuel train that needs to be taken to the mines today. That is your first job. See to it at once. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I can only imagine how quickly Thomas must have moved to pick up those tankers. He collected his train on time and made good progress down the main line. However, this delivery wouldn't go exactly to plan. Arriving at Napford Station, he was forced to stop as a faulty set of points was blocking his way. As he waited, sizzling and fuming all the while, a very curious thing happened to our number one. Mummy, mummy, look, it's Thomas. I see him, Kenny. Hi, Thomas. Um, hello there. I'm sorry, do I know you? Sorry, Thomas, my son's been reading that new book about you. Oh, I see. Hello, Kenny, is it? Yep, that's me. Where are Annie and Clarabelle? Percy's taking them today. Who's Percy? Hasn't Wilbert written a book about him yet? Well, Percy's a friend of mine. Are you friends with all the engines? Yes, of course. Even Gordon? Yes, even Gordon. Even after he pulled you along behind his express? After he what? That's my favorite story. All right, Kenny, come along. I'm sure Thomas has a lot of work to do. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us, Thomas. Um, no worries. Is there something you didn't tell me, Lachlan? What sort of something, Thomas? Don't go on like that. You said Wilbert wrote a book about me. What was it about? Hold up a moment. Ah, it looks like the lads have fixed the points. We can head off now. So are you going to tell me about this story or not? Which one, Thomas? 
All the way to the mine, Thomas's driver told him about the recently released book that chronicled a number of his supposed hijinxes, like being trailed behind Gordon at high speeds, his trouble with trucks, and rescuing James after he had an accident. Our number one was awash with mixed feelings on the matter, which were reminiscent of the rest of us. It should come as no surprise that I'm talking about the Railway series of children's books published by Reverend Wilbert Audrey. Of course we all knew about these books from the day they were released on May 12th, 1945. And after they began growing in popularity, we were admittedly thrilled by the prospect we would gain a measure of celebrity. It certainly was a joy when people began asking us of our escapades. Unfortunately, that's where the problems began to emerge. As time went on and more books were released, visitors to Sodor began asking about events that were either inaccurate or entirely fictional. Some took it a step further and even insulted us for poor behavior that we never exhibited. This latter issue annoyed some more than others. Gordon, you're getting worked up over nothing. Easy for you to say. That wretched book depicted you as a sympathetic victim while I was shown to be an aggressive bully. And then there is the disgraceful attitude I displayed, refusing to shut my own coaches and pull goods trains. You can hardly deny that's who you used to be. Exactly, who I used to be, not who I am now. Why didn't Wilbert feel it necessary to write about such a change? Character progression is a staple of literature. So is the reality that an author often writes fiction based on actual events and people. And that's just what it is, fiction. A writer will often make changes in order to appeal to their target audience, which in this case is children. But must it be done by defaming the character of said inspirational figures? Well, if you want to talk about defamation of character, old boy, I would say Henry copped it worse than you. Hmm. Yes, indeed. I would have to agree. Once an engine attached to a train was afraid of a few drops of rain. It went into a tunnel and squeaked through its funnel and wouldn't come out again. Yes, yes, that's very funny. Bye, Henry. Bye bye. Yeah, we prat. Ah, I don't believe it. This is proof. This is outrageous. What's the matter with you? Some kid on the platform sang that ridiculous rhyme about me. Ugh, I swear, I'm going to hiss steam at the next git who does. Um... What? No, no, nothing. Come along, Sam. Out with it. Well, I'm not going to say it, Henry, so you needn't weesh me. But... Is it true? Did you really hide in the tunnel because of a bit of rain? Of course not! Have you forgotten that rain is water, an essential ingredient to our means of propulsion? A steam engine that's afraid of water is more ridiculous than a pilot who's afraid of heights. But then again, the true version I would hardly consider family friendly. There's a true version? Oh yes. Shall I? Go ahead. Once an engine attached to a train heard the whir of the Nazi planes. With a squeak of his funnel, he hid in the tunnel and waited until it was safe again. Nazi planes? Aye. It was the night the Blitz came to Sodor. I was taking a passenger train at the time and heard the planes flying overhead. By some great miracle, I was near Balahu Tunnel and dashed inside so fast I nearly popped out the other end. I waited for what felt like hours, hearing the distant explosions as Napbird was being bombed to oblivion and then came one blast so loud I was nearly rocked off my rails. That would have been the blast that claimed the life of a dear friend of ours. Oh, I'm so sorry. Who was it? His name was Colin, and he died taking a train of gunpowder vans out of the yard in order to prevent a greater loss of life. In light of such details, Henry, perhaps it is understandable why the Reverend wrote his story the way he did. Maybe, but it still burns my boiler. And I'm serious, if anyone else starts to say it, once an engine attached to a train, gah! <coughs> oh, nice.
All right there, Adam? No, Drolin, I am not. Oh? Is something wrong? I took a passenger train this morning, and the entire time I was waiting at the platform, they kept asking, Do you know Edward? Do you know Henry? Do you know Gordon? Do you know Thomas? It was very annoying. It sure sounds like it was. And when I introduced myself, most just gave a dismissive, yes we know, and then walked off. Are you surprised? No, not really. But I am surprised none of them asked about Colin or Lily. That's because the Reverend hasn't written anything about them. And I don't think he will. Which is a disgrace. They died as heroes and deserve to be recognized for it. I had a similar conversation with James just before the reshuffle. He was put out by the fact Mr. Star was omitted and replaced by the fact controller. In light of recent events, I say this was a strange case of life imitating art. Why do you think the Reverend wrote that Sir Topham was always out, boss? Maybe because he's more well known. That'd explain why Mr. Zorro wasn't included. Though I will say, Sir Topham's depiction in the Railway series hasn't exactly been favorable. What sort of controller would be daft enough to wall up an engine inside a tunnel? That's not only uneconomical, it's impractical. Sounds like a good idea to me. And you know what else? None of us middies have been shown in the books. Which suits me just fine. That's not what you said last month. Last month, I hadn't heard all the stories. Then the ones about Thomas came out. And you know what? Let the Nor'easters have all the humiliation. Come on, Diesel. You're not going to fall back into old habits, are you? No, I'm just saying. And I'm just saying to you, Diesel. I need you to shunt some extra coaches for the next train. Extra coaches? How many more? Five. Five? Are we getting a royal visit or something? It's all these tourists. The extra work is annoying, but the additional fares are welcome. Get those coaches sorted, Diesel. Sharpish. Right, ya. Yeah. As I mentioned before in passing, many visitors to Sodor asked us of our exploits. And indeed, those same visitors had come to the island because of the growing popularity of the railway series. This rise in tourism was warmly welcomed and led to an increase in revenue for the council, which they then used to invest in a number of projects, one of which I will discuss in a future story. I will say, however, it did get a bit grating having to explain to these people what had and hadn't happened to us. And it did become obvious that only engines of the Nor'easters had been featured in the series up to that point. This created jealousy and resentment and threatened to reignite the rivalry that had once divided us. I said move those tankers over there! Why? What's wrong with where they are? It's blocking access to a train I'm trying to marshal for Peter! Well, if I put them over there, I won't be able to use the turntable. And I need to get back to Ellsbridge in half an hour. Then move your bunker and your train while you're at it. I have a better idea. You move my train, I'll move my bunker. Nor'easter nitwit! Midi more! Oh, bother! Well done, you daft git! Now I'm stuck in this siding! I'm fine, by the way. Thanks for your concern. Thank you, Mickey. Not a worry, Percy. I'm just glad it wasn't something more serious. Unless you count stupidity as serious. Don't be surprised if Wilbert doesn't write a book about you after this. What are you on about, Adam? Don't mind him, Chief. He's just mad because he knows war criminals don't belong in children's books. Why, you son of a... Knock it off, the both of you! Are you seriously getting bent out of shape over a silly children's book? Sure sounds like it. Good morning, Sir Topham. Morning, Leonard. I take it you've seen today's issue of the Sudrian Tribute? Indeed. Children's book leads to accident? The media certainly know how to create a misleading headline. Tell me it isn't true. I checked, Sir Topham. No, it isn't. That's a relief. Then why did this reporter imply that it was? Probably because it'll sell a lot more copies. 
but I'm told Percy and Adam began arguing about the railway series in the aftermath of the incident. This is rather concerning, Leonard. I need to nip this in the bud before it blossoms into something worse. What did you have in mind, Sir Topham? I'm going to address the engines, but I shan't do it alone. Don't give me that, James. You were slow getting out of Knapford, which meant I was late getting to Barrow. The only reason I was slow, Peter, was because Donald dallied on the turntable. I dallied because the stupid thing jammed. That wasn't my fault. Funny how things always seem to break or go wrong when a midi is about, eh, Gordon? Indeed, Henry. They could benefit from some Norries to tutelage. And what exactly could you teach us? How to break down on hills, or how to race a bus at high speeds with a fully loaded passenger train? How dare you, Reginald! What an insult! It's disgraceful! Disgusting! Despicable! Mind if I use that? <coughs> w- Wilbert? Is that you? Hello, Gordon. Hello, everyone. It's so good to see you all. Likewise, what brings you back to Sodor? My invitation. I have asked the Reverend here because I feel he can better explain the reasons why he wrote his books the way he did. But before he does, I would just like to say how disappointed I am. You all survived the war, some of you braved the perils of the front line, and yet you go into a tizzy because of a collection of children's books. I expect my engines to be made of stronger stuff. Due respect, sir. Those books didn't paint us in a positive light. You neither in some instances. And I don't let it upset me for the simple fact it is fiction. None of it happened the way it was described. Then why describe events in such a way to begin with? I will let the Reverend answer that. Thank you, Sir Topham. Yes, I use some of you as inspiration for my books. But I can't emphasize strongly enough that I never intended to slander any of you. As to why I wrote them the way I did, the answer is simple. To entertain children. In order to do that, I had to take liberties with certain events and make up others out of whole cloth. But why did you have to make them so... outlandish? Because my son enjoyed them. Your son? He was ill a few years ago, and I told him stories using some of you as characters. He enjoyed them so much that I became inspired to write them down. It was my hope such stories could brighten the lives of other children. What about those who died during the war? Are you going to use them in your stories? No. It would be disrespectful and inappropriate to use a children's book to describe such losses. Not to mention those children reading them might not want to be reminded of the war. Exactly. You know, now that I think about it, it is kind of funny. Hiding in a tunnel because of rain. And I suppose my past conduct does deserve to be remembered. At least it's done in a humorous way. Um, Wilbert, at the risk of sounding vain, will the rest of you be in my stories? In truth, I haven't decided. I suppose only time will tell. To those of us working on the branch lines, Wilbert outlined his reasons for writing his stories the way he did. The Fat Controller also had a few stern words to deliver. Ones that made us realize how silly it was we were letting ourselves be divided over a piece of fiction. I'm pleased to say the temporary rift that formed between us quickly closed and we moved on like nothing had happened. Of course, throughout the years that followed, people still asked us about the events described in the Reverend's books. I won't lie, it sometimes gets annoying. But on the whole, it's been a thrill to speak with these fans. And I will say, not all of Wilbert's future stories would be fictional. Indeed, some would be rooted entirely in fact.